Treehouse? I built it with my mom and dad. I hope my two best friends, Matthew and Jacob, will be surprised. Okay, you can take off your blindfolds. Whoa! How did you do this? Who built this? I did, of course, with the help of my mom and dad. Yeah, how does Spider get in my clubhouse? Don't worry about it. Good afternoon. This is Kids Science News Network. This just in. The Public Health Department in Pewsville is issuing a warning today. Some residents are reporting a really, really bad stink in the air. Reporter I Am Listening is on the scene with this live report. No one knows the source of the smell. With me right now is resident P.U. What did you notice? I just smell this really foul odor. And I don't know where it's coming from. But I really can't tell because I smell so beautiful. But yuck! Okay, thank you, P.U. That's about all the information we have from here. Now back to you. The present questions include, what's causing all this stink? And how is this going to impact us? Please call us within the week. We need your help. If you solve this problem, we will feature you on our cover story. This is KSNN. I'm kind of worried about the stink. I hate bad smells. I know. Fuseville isn't too far away. I don't want to get sick from the smell. And I'm kind of worried about my grandmother. She has breathing problems. I have an idea. What's that? We could help KSN in. Yeah. Yeah, we could help them solve the problem. And become stars. Maybe they'll even put our picture on the news. Can you imagine being on the local news? There's more to this than becoming a star. Yeah. We could actually solve the problem. Well, that too. Okay, where do we start? Let's figure out what the problem really is. Hmm. Okay, what do we know so far? Well, we know that something really, really stinks. Hold on, let's write this down. Okay, we know the Fusewell Public Health Department gave a warning. And some people in Fuseville smelled something really bad. And no one knows where the smell is coming from. I know that we'll be famous if we figure this problem out. But we only have a week. Good point. <laughs> so it comes down to what to smell. OK. On the board, we have three columns. At first of these, we have what we know. And then we have what we need to know and where to go to get the information. But we really need to know a lot more than we do now. Like what? Like, what's in a smell? Are all smells bad for you? I know a skunk stinks, but the smell can't kill you. Good point. <laughs> and your shoes smell, but I guess we'll live. And my dog's breath is really bad. Okay guys, get serious about this. We need to know how a smell moves. Why? If we're going to solve the problem, we need to know how the smell got there in the first place. Let's experiment. Okay, if we're going to do experiments, we need to know how we can do experiments to help us solve the problem. Where is Pew's roll from here? It's is that it way? way? Oh. Uh, uh, um, I think we need a map of the area. Yeah. I've got one at home. I'll bring it over tomorrow. Let's go over and talk to our neighbor, Dr. D. He's a retired science professor. He's in his yard. Hello up there. What are all of you up to? We're trying to find answers to some really big questions. Hey, that's why did it work. So how do you find answers? I like to use three basic resources. Books, 
the internet, and experts I can find to help. Gotcha, Dr. D. Thanks, Dr. D. Goodbye. Let's put a search under smell. S-M-E-L-L. -L. This is fun. Do you use the internet for your homework? Let's see what it says on smell. Listen to this. We have the best sense of smell at the age of 10. Hey, that's us. Let's click here. Oh, that's the fun fact file. Snakes smell with their tongues. Their tongue detects danger. Sharks are called hounds of the sea because they can find just one spot of blood from over one mile away. We need to find out what's causing the stink. That's if we want to get on KSN. I'll show them. We'll all be stars on KSNN. Let's just go check in with Dr. D. Hey, Dr. D. What you working on? Just for my regular projects. Wow, that's neat. Can we take a ride on it? I think we're quite ready for that. Hi, Geronimo. Are you getting along with Bernie today? <laughs> yeah, right. Look, Geronimo wants to help. So, did you do a little investigating on the problem? What did you find out? A lot. We found out you develop your best sense of smell at age 10. Yes, we gathered a lot of information, but we're not sure where it's going yet. Dr. D, did you see the KSNN story on stink? Dr. D, what makes things stink? Hold on, guys. I don't have all the answers, but I might be able to get you started in the right direction. First of all, not everyone thinks the same things stink. Well, I agree. We all think a pig farm really stinks. <laughs> I think you may want to use a scientific method to help figure this out. Science? Like what we study in school? Yes, the scientific method is a step-by-step -step way to solve problems. Actually, we use it every day. Look at this chart. We usually start with a problem. Then we ask a lot of questions, gather a lot of information, and then form a hypothesis. We test that hypothesis by collecting data. If the data doesn't support the hypothesis, we try again. Oh, hi. Listen carefully and you too learn all about the scientific method. Let's in on something. If this group uses the scientific method, there's a good chance they'll figure out the problem. I'll check in with you later. My mom works at NASA and she says the scientists there use the scientific method. Aren't scientists kind of weird? Yeah, like the weird ones you see on Saturday morning cartoons. Hey, watch it. My mom's a scientist. And let me tell you, she's not at all weird. Yes, you're right. Scientists come from families like yours. My mom doesn't walk the halls wearing a strange white coat. Scientists must be curious. That's right, Bernie. Do they ask a lot of questions? I would make a good scientist because I always want to know why. It's like when you see something kind of weird. Your first question is, hey, why is this going on? A big part of science is observing and questioning. You mean? Observing with your eyes? Let me show you an example of why it's very important to observe carefully. First, I'll drop the basketball. Now the softball. Now watch careful. I drop them both together. Whoa! Now tell me, how high did this basketball bounce? I didn't notice. Neither did I. Flying softball was a real distraction, wasn't it? Let's try it once more. Oh! It hardly even bounced. I guess it's easy to miss something even when you're trying to observe it. Scientists observe with all their senses. They also use tools like telescopes and microscopes to help them make observations. What kind of tools could we use to help us with the smells? I hope they're not too expensive. I already spent this week's allowance. All good scientists write down their information. Make sure you keep good notes of what you find out. Good thing we made up that board. <laughs> This is a must, even if you don't like to write. Look, we already started taking notes. You, mister, need to get a better notebook. I think you're ready to take the next step into the world of stink. I'm ready. If you guys are planning on doing any experiments yourselves, you really need to visit with someone who's great at designing and doing some cool experiments. Her name is Monica Barnes. She works at NASA. And guess what? She's expecting you. I figured you'd want to use her as a resource person. See you later, Dr. D. Bye. Bye. Oh, I wish them good luck. Hey, Miss Barnes. Hi. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Bianca, and this is Jacob and Matthew. Dr. D told us we needed to learn more about the scientific method. It might help us solve the problem of stink invading the town of Fuseville. We are hoping you could help us. Wow, look at this place. Hey, this doesn't look like a lab. This looks like a plane. Are you a scientist? Well, not exactly. Let me ask you something. Have you ever heard of an engineer? An engineer? Isn't that someone that drives a train, designs, or invents something? That's correct, on all accounts. I'm an electronics engineer, and we use math, science, and principles of electronics in order to help us with our flying laboratory. A flying laboratory? What do you mean by that? Come on, kids. Let me show you how it works. Our plane is more like a computer lab with lots of electronic equipment and aircraft systems. And here we even have a real cockpit, just like normal planes. I'd like to be a pilot one day. And I'm sure you will. Well, maybe you can fly this plane. Cool. <laughs> we have several experimental stations in our plane which are all tied together in a network. They work together to help us to collect data while we're flying and landing. The type of data we collect depends on the type of research we're conducting. Get it? Yes, but how do you use a scientific method on your job? Well, the first thing we do using the scientific method is to identify a problem, right? Right. right. Well, the second thing we do in using the scientific method is to collect data related to the problem by changing certain variables. What are variables? Well, variables are just changes. We change one or more things, one at a time, and then we measure the results of that change. How are you going to do that? During the winter season, we are going to take the airplane to a very cold place, like up in Michigan near the Great Lakes, and land it on a very long runway. Then we'll test the plane by landing it on a runway to see how long it takes once the brakes are applied to stop the plane. This tells us how much friction that we have on the tires. It's just like taking your bicycle and trying to stop on ice or snow instead of on a dry, smooth road. So we'll test at least four variables in our experiment. A dry surface, wet surface, icy surface, and a snowy surface. Let me show you how we can look at some of our data. We can observe all of the different camera views at the video station. These computer-generated graphics displays help us see how the airplane is traveling down the runway. Wow, cool pictures! It can handle millions of bytes of data all at once. This represents the data collection part of the scientific method, and the results come out in a pattern of numbers that the researchers can use to tell how the tires reacted with the runway surface. Awesome! What do we do next? Next, we take the data that we collected and we analyze it in order to help us solve our runway friction problem. We can use what we find from analyzing the data to make better runways and landing gear to help our planes to land more safely during bad or inclement weather. This is the way that we help make our airplanes and airports safer for you and me. So this is how we use the scientific method on our Boeing 757 research laboratory out here at the NASA Langley Research Center. Now that we've shown you how to first identify a problem, next to collect the data by changing certain variables, maybe you can use this method in order to solve your problem with the stink. Yes, I think we should think about our variables for the investigation of stink. The stink and variables. It's getting late. We better go over what we already know. Huh? We need to find out what variables may be part of this problem. Look, we got an email. Dr. D wants us to go to the sanitation department. Ugh! Isn't that where all that stuff goes? Why would he want us to go there? To torture us? No. That's where he said the experts track a stink. Okay, this goes on the board under where to go. Let's go there and see what we can find. And then we'll call Dr. D and update him on our findings. I can't believe I'm wasting my time on this. We'll never solve this problem. Watch, we'll prove him wrong. So what's up? Will our treehouse detectives be able to solve this problem? Will they be able to clearly define the problem? And what help can you give? Tune in next time for Search for the Stink. I'll sneak through the secret door. She won't even know I'm here. Bianca, where are you? Here I am. 
Where? Over here. <laughs> Can I take a ride? Sure. Hey, I've got the map. Come on down, let's get started on solving the stink problem. Look, there's where we are, big city. Okay, where's Fuseville? Hey, here's Xville. Look, there's Mid City. That's pretty close to us. Oh, here's Fuseville. That's pretty far away. Whew, maybe the smell won't reach us. What do we need to do to solve this problem? Let's go to the board. Yesterday, Monica Barnes and Dr. D showed us stuff about doing experiments. Yeah, and using that scientific method and learning more about variables and their importance in investigating a problem. So what now? I think before we move on any further, we still need to learn more about the scientific method. Dr. D says it will definitely help us. The stink experts may be able to help us there. Come on, let's head over to the sanitation department now. Okay, come on, let's go. A brush should be here any minute. This should be an interesting smell journey. It's all part of being a scientist. So let's get up and go. Okay, we're here. But now where do we go? Wow, look how big this place is. It's pretty neat. Look, there's someone straight ahead. She must be the smell expert. We're meeting a scientist named Paula Hogg. Hi guys, I've been expecting you. Dr. D said you would be on your way. Hi, I'm Bianca. This is Matthew and Jacob. I'm Paula, how can I help you? We want to get our faces on KSNN. What he means is he wants to help KSNN find the source of the smell. Oh, well I can show you where the source of the odor starts here. But first you're going to need some of these. Do you use a scientific method here? Yes, we do. The first step is to find and observe the problem. This is where the wastewater comes into the plant from our homes. The wastewater contains odorous substances like hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. Hydrogen sulfide is sometimes called the rotten egg gas. Some of these substances are formed in the sewer when bacteria break down organic material in the wastewater. coming from. Yes, and you're using your sense of smell to observe the problem. The next step is to collect data. Hey, me, what is that? It's a hydrogen sulfide meter. What does it show us? With this, we can measure exactly how much hydrogen sulfide gas is in the air. And next, we need to come up with a hypothesis. Do you know what a hypothesis is? I do. It's a guess. Well, it's an educated guess. It's when we use our facts, observations, and data to come up with a possible answer to the problem. Is this where you get rid of the odor? Yes, it is. We know that the odor is mainly caused by the release of hydrogen sulfide gas, which can be controlled by chemical processes such as these. What's that? These are scrubbers. Look through the window and observe the odor removal process. These wet scrubbers change the gas and turn it into liquid, which removes the odor. And we use all of our data and observation to make sure this system works. How do you know if your hypothesis is working? We test our hypothesis every day at the treatment plant. We use our noses again? Yes, our sense of smell can tell us if the odor is being controlled. But we also use a meter. Plant operators check the sulfide levels going into and coming out of the scrubbing system at least a dozen times a day. Based on this, we can make adjustments to the odor control process. The smell is much better. Does this remove all the odor? Well, under the right conditions, almost all of the odor can be taken away. This is the aeration basin. Look closely. A lot of change is happening here. Bacteria are working to remove odor and other pollutants. After all this, I'm sure the water must be really clean. And the odor has to be gone. Well, that's the goal. 
But if there's still an odor, we can go back to the scientific method to solve our problem. The scientific method. But how do you know the odor is gone for good? Well, at the end of the treatment process, we test to make sure that the odor and other pollutants are gone. This place is really cool. Mm -hmm. Wow, it looks so clean. Wow. wow! Well, have you learned enough about the scientific method to help you with your smell problem? Yes, I think we all should think about a hypothesis. Yes, a hypothesis and variables. Hi, Dr. D. Oh, it's the Investigative Smells team. How you doing? We visited the smell experts at the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, and a scientist named Paula Hogg showed us how she used the scientific method on her job to track stinks at the plant. So tell me, did you learn any more about science? Yes? We learned that why scientists ask so many questions. It's because they're curious. Why don't you try one of these information sheets? I always use them to keep me straight when I'm researching problems. Hmm identifies a variety of potential sources of information. What about next? Identifies inaccurate and misleading information, selects information appropriate to the problem or question at hand. This looks like it'll be helpful. Thanks, Dr. D. Hey, it's an update from KSNN. We have crews on the scene in Pewsville. On this Tuesday afternoon, the stink appears to be gone, and no one has reported getting sick from it. We just received word that a group of young detectives are trying to solve this mystery. If you want to help them, check out our website. This is KSNN. Hey, Dr. D must have called the news station. I think they're talking about us. This is really cool. Yeah. Think how many people will know about us. I'm glad the smell's gone and nobody got sick. But... What if the smell comes back? Comes back? Oh no! We have to get this figured out now! I agree. We need I help. Ha I have an idea. We can ask our friends at school to help us. Yeah, but we still need to take a guess as to what's causing it. I think that's called a hypothesis. <laughs> no, you mean a hypothesis. Here, let me put it on the board. Whatever. And then we need to, you Hold know. On. Look at this. It's a map. No, the small print. Oh, why didn't I think of this? It says chemical plant. That's it. Oh, it's kind of near Fuseville. I get it now. It's all coming back to me. This is great. We're definitely going to be on KSNN now. Yeah. Chemical plant. This is definitely where the smell's coming from. I think we have a hypothesis. I hope we're right. But, yeah. Because this all just seems a little too easy to me. Maybe we're just good at this detective game. Maybe. Maybe. Never know. Wow, look at all the email we've received. There must be a million yeah. of them. Or close to it. Hey, school starts pretty soon. Maybe we should download all of this and take it to school with us. And maybe we could get our friends to help us sort it out. Yeah. Got it. Let's go. Okay. Hey, yeah, I'll grab the map. Cool. <laughs> Hello, we're on time, but we do need your help. Our help? Aren't you the famous investigative team? Okay, so you saw us on KSNN last night? How can we help? We have a ton of information to go through. A lot of residents have emailed us to let us know if they smelled a bad stink. So what have you done so far? We started out by writing down what we knew about the problem. We asked a lot of questions, wrote down a bunch of new questions, and talked to a lot of experts. So here's what we know about the problem. The Fuseville Health Department gave a warning on Monday that a lot of people in the town were smelling a bad smell. But no one knows where the smell is coming from. We need to figure out what's causing the stink. We asked the residents to email us to report if they found anything. So we were sort of hoping that you could help us to gather the comments. Wow, look at all that email. What do we do with it? How about if we start by separating them by the cities? Fusville, Mid-City, Xville, and Big City. Yeah, and then we can separate them into two pals, one for Monday and one for Tuesday. That will help us to chart it down. <laughs> Look, nobody smelled anything in Big City or Mid City on either day. 
This is weird. Look at all the people in Xville who said they smelled the usual on both days. The usual? And a couple of people said they think it's a paper mill and they're not worried. Hey, look, here's the paper mill over here. And it's north of Xville. And look, the trash burning plant is over here too. But almost everyone in Pewsville said that they smell something really bad on Monday, but not on Tuesday. So maybe it really is the paper mill. Well, it would have knocked them out in Xville if it was so bad in Pewsville on Monday. But Pewsville didn't smell anything on Tuesday when Xville still did. Maybe something kept the smell from getting there on Tuesday. Maybe we should do an experiment on how smell moves. Experiment? Cool. Wait a minute. Nobody in Mid-City smelled it on either day. And look, it's right next to the chemical plant. Hmm, this is really strange. Could we be wrong? Maybe the chemical plant isn't causing all the stink. But yesterday, we figured out that it was the chemical plant. I still think it is. That's our hypothesis, remember? But we might be wrong. We need an expert opinion. Let's go back and tell Dr. D after school. He might be able to tell us if we're right. Let's go. Hi, Dr. D. Hello again. What's wrong? You look like your cat just died. No, that didn't happen. Wishful thinking, Bummer. Bernie. We thought we had the problem all figured out. We thought the stink was coming from the chemical plant. Look at this. But if the stink was coming from the chemical plant, the people in Mid-City would definitely smell it. But they didn't. It might have been the paper mill, but why didn't the people in Xville smell it really strong on Monday? And then why didn't the people in Fuseville smell it on Tuesday? Either people are smelling it differently or something else is going on. I was thinking maybe we could do an experiment to see how smell travels. What would your variables be then? Variables? Remember what Monica Barnes said? It's one specific thing that you, the experimenter, has control over. It can affect or change the results of your experiment. That's right. Let's use my wave machine as an example. When I wiggle this rod, it makes waves of medium height. The distance between waves we call the wavelength. How can we change the wavelength? I think if you wiggle the rods faster, it'll make the wavelength shorter. No, the wavelength will be longer. Well, frequency or how fast I wiggle the rod is a variable because it affects the wavelength. It's important to only change one variable at a time. Like not changing the weight at all. That's right. If we change the wave height, making it bigger or smaller, that might, that might also affect the wavelength. Well, let's try it. I'll wiggle the rods at a faster frequency at medium height and see what happens. Yes, I rule. The wavelength was shorter. Does that help you remember? Kind of. I guess we need to think through about how a smell moves. OK, let's go back to the treehouse and get to work. Bye. Bye-bye. Dr. D. Hey, they're talking about us again. An update this Wednesday afternoon. The stink is back in the town of Pewsville. And now, some Exville residents are reporting a different smell. Hopefully, the treehouse detectives are still working on the case. It's still a problem. The stink didn't go away. Okay, we better look at this again. Oh no, not that again. So what's up? Have the treehouse detectives found the source of the stink? What do you think? Is their hypothesis right or wrong? You'll want to join us next time for We're Almost There! Hey, my neighbor is a special nose doctor. Maybe knowing how people smell can tell us if the residents are smelling the stink differently. Come on, let's dial him up. See if he can tell us anything. His name is Dr. George Shackner. Here he is. Oh, hello. Hi, Bianca. Hi, this is Jacob and Matthew. <laughs> We're trying to solve a stink problem for KSNN. So are you the treehouse detectives? That's us. We want to know why we smell certain things. Or how our noses work. With more information, we might be able to sniff at the problem. 
Well, everything that smells or has an aroma has microscopic molecules or little particles that come off and drift into the air. Once it gets into the air, it comes in contact with the nose. It goes inside the nose and then to a very special place that's set up just to help you understand what the smell is. But how does your brain recognize different smells? Depending upon the kind of molecules that come into the nose, the brain will understand what is going on with the smell. Now, for example, pizza may have five little places in the nose for its identification, whereas perfume may have six or seven, and each of those places is very different. Do all of us smell the same thing? Well, we do not know if uh, everybody smells the same smells. What we do know is that people can identify things uh, the same. Now, for example, two children walking into the kitchen may smell something cooking on the stove, and we'll know right away, for example, that their mother is making hot dogs. Now, what can change that is if one of the children came from the garage and had just been watching their daddy cleaning a paintbrush with turpentine, and all that turpentine smell was in the nose. That would change how that person smells. I have some questions. What about dogs or other animals? Do they have the same nose as we do for sniffing? The, the same, same nose! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. You've heard the saying, you've got a nose like a shark. Yes! I have a friend you may want to visit at the Virginia Marine Science Museum. To check out sharks? We'll make the time. Good luck on your project. See you later. It's really too bad Bianca couldn't make it, but I'll be sure to take really good notes for her. Hey, look, this is a cool aquarium. Hey, guys, come on over here. My name's Beth Fershaw. I'm a curator here at the Virginia Marine Science Museum. Dr. Schechter told me you'd be coming. What's this? This is the seal habitat, but I bet you guys want to see the shark aquarium. Come on inside, let's check it out. Maybe that big nose can help us work through the stink problem. We're learning a lot about smells. We visited Dr. Schechter, and he told us how our noses work. Hmm. Maybe you and these sharks can help us learn more about smells. We know that some chemical compounds have smells to them, and our noses have special cells that can receive those smells. That's right. Those cells are called olfactory chemoreceptors, and sharks have them too. Now, if you live out of the water like you and me, the air carries the smell to our noses. If you live in the water like the sharks, the water carries the smell. What? What this means is, is that animals, like those sharks, have a sense of smell, even underwater. Does this mean that sharks have a better sense of smell than we do? So they can smell hamburgers better than me. Well, not exactly. Their sense of smell is tuned to the smells that help them survive in the wild. They're top predators, and being able to smell their prey is very important. Did you know that the shark's brain is devoted mostly to its sense of smell? So when it comes to smelling, the sharks really know how to get to the bottom of the stinky stuff. Take a long look at this shark's nose. Did you know that it can sniff out one drop of blood in 25 gallons of water? I guess we better go back and piece this all together. See you later. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks Bye. for helping us. That was so cool. Now we know that some of us smell more than others. But would a whole town use their noses differently? Hmm, that's a good question. I guess we still need to figure out how smell moves through the air. Let's see. I have an idea. This may seem weird, but I wonder if all smells travel through the air at the same speed. Huh? huh? Yes. I wonder if the source of the stink could move faster to one area than another. Hey, that may be related to why the towns are smelling the smell differently. Do you want to test in our treehouse? You mean do our own little smell experiment? Yeah, I have a bottle of air spray. See this? Hmm, let's stand in the middle of the room. Okay, stand there. I'm gonna spray this. You guys count to see how long it gets to reach your nose. Okay. Now close your eyes. Okay, let's try it. It took me exactly three seconds. It took me three seconds too. What does it mean? It must mean 
that we have the same noses. Big ones, right? <laughs> no, it means smell travels at the same rate of speed. So if it does, then why wouldn't everyone eventually smell it? Hmm, another good question. What do you think? I think next time we meet, we should do more experimenting. You mean more work? Yes, that's how we get the job done. Here, Here we, we go, go again. again! Hi, Dr. D. It looks like you fixed things up around here. Hey, Geronimo. Hi, hey, Bernie. Hi, Bernie. You feel like a lot happier than when I saw you last, don't they, Geronimo and Bernie? We feel better now. We might be getting closer to finding the stink. Guess what? We have an idea on how stink travels to the different cities. We stood in a circle and sprayed something into the air. And it reached our noses in exactly the same amount of time. So, maybe the cities are located at equal distance apart from the stink. What do you think of that, Dr. D? Pretty cool, huh? Whoa, whoa, guys, hold on. You might be getting a little ahead of yourselves. First of all, have you been careful at how you've experimented? We you think so. You said an equal distance apart. Is there anything else in the clubhouse that smells? Well... The big question is, have you been careful to keep everything the same? What are you talking about? Think about your experiment carefully. Remember, you must plan it and not sim simply jump into it feet first. You've only tested this on the three of you. This is not a true sampling. You need to test it on a larger group. Everyone's sense of smell is different. We know Bernie has the best nose in town, but what about you, Geronimo? You're right, Bernie's got a great sniffer. But getting back to your experiment, more people will give you a truer picture of what you're looking at in your experiment. Well, we could test this on our friends at school. We have a lot of different sets of noses in our class. Let's go to school. This will be great. Thanks, Dr. D. This is great. We have enough kids to pull this off. We need to divide the class into groups of two. Excuse me, excuse me, Thanks. I have an idea. One group could actually do the experiment and the other group could time and record the data. Here are your stopwatches. Okay, let's get to it. You all need to stand in a circle. Everyone two meters from me and one meter from each other. Here's a meter stick. I'll be the measuring man. All you sniffers need to pair up with somebody with a stopwatch. And recorders stand by. That looks good. Does it look good, Mrs. Mazitis? It looks very good. <laughs> I'll stand in the middle and I'll spray the spray. When you smell it, raise your hand and your partner will push the stopwatch. Okay, let's go start the experiment. Quarters, what were your results? I got seven. Fourteen. I have fifteen. This is really strange. Really strange. I thought the results would be the same. I can't believe these numbers are different. They're all different. I guess science isn't all that predictable. I expected it to be like our other experiment, where all the numbers were the same. What do we do now? I guess we go back and tell Dr. D. Bye, everyone. Thanks for all your help. Bye. Bye. Hello, Dr. D. Where is he? Hello, Dr. Hi. D. Where are you? Hold on, hold on. I'm right here. What's wrong? You sound a little anxious and look a little windblown. Well, we thought we knew the answer. Our experiment at the treehouse showed that smell moved at the same rate of speed. But at school, it sure was different. Let's talk about the test conditions. Were they all the same? Well, the windows were shut and the fans and AC were both off. I was the measurement. I know all our friends were standing equal distance from each other. I have an idea. Did you watch everyone and how they smelled the air spray? Did they breathe normally or take a big sniff like this? I know George had a cold. You can't always control the situation. There might be variations in sensitivity or how your friends smelled the air spray. If look at the data you collected. We may want to ignore the 45 and the 20. Because as you can see, they're pretty far away from the other numbers in the group. These numbers can be mistakes in measuring and might be misleading when you're trying to make sense of your data. If we look at the rest of the numbers, they are very close, but not the same because of variations like George's cold. 
So basically we were right. Smell does travel at the same rate of speed, but different things influence it. Do certain things make smells move faster or slower? I think you need to do some more investigating. We know in more investigating. investigating. We're never going to get on KSNN. Hmm, what's that noise? Oh, it's just the wind blowing. It's nasty outside. Hmm, I wonder, could this be one of our variables? It could be. I think you three need to do some more experimenting. I have a gut feeling this could be the answer. You may be right. You have a lot of guts. I do not. Do so. so. Whatever. Oh, come on, you have a gut feeling. Good afternoon this Thursday. We have an update on the stink. Now some residents in Big City are reporting they're smelling something really bad. It appears this mysterious smell is moving in a different direction. This wind's not helping the situation. Today it's blowing from the west. That's towards us. I told you I smelled something. It smells like old socks. I still think it's the wind moving things around. That's brilliant. You'll see what I mean. Let's go to our board. I do like using this. It helps us chart out our plan to attack the stink. We know something is driving the smell and it's coming our way. We know it's really windy. We need to find out, does wind move smell? So where do we go? Definitely to our school to do experiments. Maybe to see those weather people. They know all about wind and wind direction. Our mom could hook us up with some scientists at NASA because they definitely know why things move through the air. Let's go try our experiment at school. Hey look, it's a clown face now instead of a spider. Weird. Maybe we can catch up with everyone. Let's go. I wonder what would give the same feeling as wind. You have a lot of hot air. Why don't you just sit there and blow at the spray? Yeah, right. Hey, maybe a fan. That might work. Yeah. Okay, this time we want some people to the front of the fan, some to the back of it, and some to the side. Okay. Everyone close your eyes. When I release the sacred smell, raise your hand when you smell it. I'll turn on the fan, and I'll get the stopwatches. I'll be the measuring man, too. I'll make sure everyone is two meters apart. Okay, let's count her down. In five, four, three, two, one. Wow, look at those hands go up. I wonder why those standing in the back and to the side of the fan aren't raising their hands. Oh, there they go. Look at them now. Let's do this experiment again to see if we get the same results. Do you notice a pattern? I think I do notice something. Everyone standing in front of the fan smells the spray really, really fast. But look how long it took those standing in the back and to the side of the fan. Almost twice as long. This looks like a pattern. I bet you the wind is pushing the stink towards us. In fact, I can still smell it outside. We might be onto something. Let's do the experiment one more time and examine the data carefully. Okay, here we go again. The job of being a scientist is a lot of hard work. What do you think? Do you know what's throwing up this thing? Can you figure it out before we do? I sure hope so. See you later. So what's up? Will the treehouse detective solve the problem before the stink takes over their town? Could wind be the variable that leads them to the source? Will the fan experiment be the key in unlocking the hidden stink? You'll want to join us next time for This Is It, the conclusion of the Wi-Fi house you won't want to miss. This is a KSNN weather update. After the strong westerly winds we had yesterday, it appears that the wind has shifted back from the north today. Looking ahead to the weekend, expect sunny skies. This weather guy has all the information we need. Let's go talk to him. KSNN is just around the corner. Let's get up and go. <laughs> the guy we saw on TV? That's me. I'm Craig Moeller. I'm one of the meteorologists here at Channel 13. Yeah, we see you on TV all the time. 
You're always telling us about the weather. You tell us when it's going to rain. Being on TV is just a small part of my job. A big part is looking at weather maps like these. They tell me about the temperature, the air pressure, and the wind direction. Wind direction? That's what we're here to talk about. You see, we want to be on TV like you. We're trying to find the source of the stink that KSNN reported. I heard about that. Maybe I can help you. Come on. Mr. Muller, what generates wind? We get wind when there are differences in the air pressure. Remember, wind blows from high pressure to low pressure. Have you ever gone to the beach and maybe blown up a beach ball? Yeah. Okay, what happens when you blow it up and you don't put the cap back on the ball? All the air blows out. All the air blows out because the pressure inside the ball is greater than the pressure outside. And when the air moves from inside the ball to out, that's basically wind. I have a question. Does wind ever change direction? It sure does. As a matter of fact, I want to show you something right over here. This is a weather station, and one of the instruments you see right on top there, that's called an anemometer. That's used to measure the strength of the wind, and this up here, this is called a wind vane. This measures the direction, and as you can see, it's prepared to change with the wind. Let me show you something over on this computer. This is pretty cool. This is a weather map. We've got areas of low pressure and high pressure. As you look at this map, you'll see the winds around high pressure travel clockwise, and around low pressure travel counterclockwise. So as we look at that, which way is the wind blowing? South. south. From the south, exactly. Now take a look at tomorrow. With all of these features moving over to the east a little bit, we had the high pressure just to the west, low pressure just to our east. Again, counterclockwise around the low, clockwise around the high. Which way is the wind blowing? No, from the north. north. From the north. So as you guys can see, the wind does change direction. Mr. Muller, can wind move smell? It sure can. Wind can move a lot of things. It can move the smells, it can move water droplets, it can move volcanic ash. As a matter of fact, when a tornado spins, it can pick up debris and the wind can move it for hundreds of miles. Wow, I didn't know weather was this complicated. Here, I'll give you the wind direction for each day this week. That might help you. Cool. Let's take these back to Dr. G's lab, and we can find the wind direction and track the smell. We'll have to study them. Aw, oh, man, that sounds like more work, and I thought we were almost there. Thanks a lot. This is a really neat place. Maybe we can come back sometime. Anytime. I'll see you guys later. Watch for us on KSNN. I'll be tuning in. Bye. See you later. See ya. Hi, Dr. D. Hi. What do you have in your hands? The official weather map from Craig Moeller. The weatherman? Yes, the meteorologist. Bernie and Geronimo recognize the name. We know now who smell the stink each day. And maybe now with the wind direction, we might be able to figure out the source. Ah, I'm so confused. How in the world do we make sense of this? I'd suggest you put all your information in a chart form, or what we call a matrix. It may help you organize all this information. I've already made a matrix. It has the days of the week across the top and the four cities down the side. Your job is to mark when each city smelled the stink each day. Later, you can compare the wind direction on each day to your chart and to the map you've already made to see what it might mean. Oh, cool. I think this will really help us. Let's go back to the treehouse and try it out. Thanks, Dr. D. Bye. Bye! I'll let you in on a secret. I think they may be on to something. Let's not waste any time. Let's get down to business. Set up that, um, the matrix. Yeah, whatever. Okay, who smelled the stink on Monday? Looking at our email, only Fuseville. Okay. And on Tuesday? No one. What about Wednesday? On Wednesday, Expo smelled it a little bit, but Fuseville got hit hard. And on Thursday, all the cities smelt it, but all of us in Big City really got hit. Yeah, man, we were plugging our noses big time yesterday. And today, Expo smelled it a little bit, but Fuseville got hit again. So what does this all mean? I think we should go to the map and see how the wind direction relates to our information. Let's go. Okay. Okay, Monday the wind was coming from the north. And Pewsville really smelled the stink. So the source could be coming from somewhere up here. So like maybe the trash burning place or the paper mill? Maybe, but on Tuesday the wind was still coming from the north and nobody smelled it. Hmm. And Wednesday the wind again was coming from the north and Fuseville got hit really bad, and Xville just a little bit. So then the source would be across from us, and on the map, that's the trash burning plant. 
On Thursday, everybody smelled the stink, and the wind changed direction. It came from over there, the west. But that was worse for us. Remember that experiment we did in class, when everyone in front of the fan got blasted? Well, maybe this is like that. Maybe Big City is right in the path of the stink. Let's look at the map. The source has to be where these two cross, right around Xville. Well, my hypothesis is a trash burning place. It has to be the source. But it's so far away from Big City. Can the wind move a smell that far? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Thanks, Dr. D, I really appreciate it. Bye. Dr. D says you would be surprised how far fires, pollutions, and smell can travel. He suggests that we talk to a friend of his at NASA who specializes in that kind of thing. Okay, that's it then. It's a trash burning plant. Let's call KSNN. in. Watch me on the news. <laughs> Look, I don't want to embarrass myself in front of all my friends. We better be right. We don't even know how far smell can travel. I still think we should talk to Dr. D's friend just to be safe. We're going to stop by NASA tomorrow before we go to KSN. Let's go. Okay. An alert for Xville today. It appears to be the only city under stink siege. Does anybody know in which direction the wind is blowing? From the south. And Dr. D says he'll pick us up from NASA. From the south what? Come on, we gotta get out there. Come on, let's get up. We know, get up and go. Dr. Jack Fishman, that's his name. I think we're supposed to meet him here. Hey, there he is. Hi, I'm Bianca, and this is Jacob and Matthew. Oh, hi guys. I'm Jack Fishman, and I work at NASA Valley Research Center in the Atmospheric Sciences Department. Is there anything I can help you with? We have one question. We were wondering if smell could travel all the way from Xville to Big City. Well, you know, that's the research area I've been doing for a long time, and I might just be able to have some answers for you. Come on over to the laboratory, and let me show you some stuff. Okay, cool. How far do smelly things travel? Oh, uh, you would really be surprised. Here at NASA Langley, in our Atmospheric Sciences Research Program, we have special instruments we put on both airplanes and even on satellites to track these smelly molecules. How far do you think they can travel? Hundreds of miles? From here to Tennessee? From here to California? Well, you'd be surprised. At one point, we actually took measurements of fires in Africa and South America, and were able to track the chemicals in the smoke hundreds and hundreds of miles off the coast. And when you were so far away from the fires, could you still smell them? The smoke was certainly less dense and not even visible, but with our special instruments, we could still tell that the smoke was in the air and the smelly molecules were, were present. And let me tell you something else. We fly instruments on satellites that are able to see the smoke and these smelly molecules travel all the way from South America, all the way around the world, or past the Pacific Ocean. Will they ever disappear? Well, actually, yes. Eventually, they'll react with another molecule to make a less smelly molecule. These molecules, in turn, may get washed out by the rainfall, and yes, they disappear. Wow, I guess the answer is yes. Smell really can travel. I guess we better go back to see if we're right. Hey, there's Dr. D. Let's go. Thanks for all your help. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. It can't be the trash burning place. I mean, we're nowhere near it. We're just south of Exville, and the stink is coming from the south. Except the candy factory. But that's not on the map. Oh, that's right, because it's new. It's new? The, the candy, candy factory? Let me get out my cooking book. That's funny. I never thought of you, Dr. D, as a gourmet. Yeah, but you know how to make artificial flavors like banana, pears, and pineapple. Okay, smell this. Yeah! Oh, what are you trying to do, knock us out? This is butyric acid. Whoa, that smells like the stink out at the factory. We're gonna take this test tube and put it in a warm water bath. Then we're gonna add to the butyric acid some ethyl alcohol and some sulfuric acid. Wow, it smells so sweet. Just like pineapples. This is great. I think we found the source of the stink. All right. Let's call Kaxon in. Hello, yes, this is Bianca. Oh great, thanks. They wanna come here? Oh, I guess that's fine. Okay, bye-bye. You won't believe this. We actually found the source. This is so cool. This is great. I'm going to be famous. 
Hey mom, guess what? We solved the stink problem, and KSNN wants to come over and interview us. Honey, that's great! Oh look, they're here. We have to go down for the taping. Let's go. That was so cool. I can't believe we're gonna be on TV. Who says this kind of stuff only happens on Make Believe TV? Turn on the TV, we should be on in a few minutes. I can't believe we made the news. More like we're making the news. We have some breaking news to report this Saturday afternoon. Our treehouse detectives found the stink. So what is the source of the smell? It's on the sun It's the new candy factory. We even saw it with our own two eyes. That's part of observation. So how did you figure it out? It wasn't easy. We used a scientific method to help us. It's really a tool we use every day. I guess we just don't think about it. So you asked a lot of questions. Then what? And then we formed a hypothesis. At first we thought it was the chemical plant causing the stink. Then our data showed us all that the cities close to the chemical plant didn't even notice the smell. We were really bummed out. But you didn't give up. We were thinking of it. But our friend Dr. D told us that real scientists never give up. Then we started thinking about how smell travels. And we decided that the wind outside must affect the smell. It's simple, you know, the wind. We found out that the fan made the smell go in a certain direction. So we figured the wind did the same thing. Get it? Huh? I think so. Yeah, I got it. And with Dr. D's help, we charted out the wind direction and compared it to the email from the residents who smelled it, which led us to a location exactly south of Exville, which is where the new candy factory is. Again, congratulations for helping us clear the air. Management at the new candy factory told us they didn't know they were causing all the stink. They say they're taking care of the problem. On Tuesday, you didn't smell the stink because the factory closed down for some work. That's all from KSNN. Remember, if you want to see us, just watch us on TV or click on our NASA website. We'll be waiting for your messages. Come on, let's watch ourselves on TV. So, are you surprised about the ending? I'll let you in on a secret. Matthew, Bianca, and Jacob might have found the location a lot sooner if they weren't using an outdated map. A new map like this shows the candy factory. Remember to always use up-to-date resources. One last science tip. Always remember to use safety precautions when doing experiments. For example, whenever I mix chemicals, I always use these safety goggles, like in our pineapple experiment. And don't forget to always have an adult present. Okay, time is running out. I'll see you for our next adventure with the Treehouse Detective on another NASA Y-Files. The NASA Y-Files is made possible through the generous support of SeaWorld and Busch Gardens and the NASA Langley Research Center's Aerospace Vehicle Systems Technology Program Office.